This is Digital Music Trends, episode 126, recorded on the 3rd of April 2013. This week on the show, Radigi loses in court, Phil Ramone's passing, the future of charts, YouTube strikes a deal with Sassen, the role of Merlin, and April's Fools. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, the weekly show bringing you the latest news in the digital music industry. DNT is available as both audio and video on iTunes, most podcasters, SoundCloud, YouTube, Mixcloud, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio. You can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter by going to digitalmusictrends.com. There is a sign up form on the right hand side of the homepage. So this week I'm really happy to welcome back on the show two great guests. Uh, first up, uh, Eamon Ford, freelance journalist writing for, amongst others for uh, Music Ally, Q, The Guardian and a bunch of other publications. So Hi, Eamon, and great to have you on the show. How's it going? Hello, I'm very well. How are you? Uh, great, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm hoping we're heading towards spring so I can remove all my thousand well, layers that I'm wearing at home. But Well, you know. we're in the UK, so we get 48 hours of spring. That's <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's straight into to winter. It's like Game of Thrones or something. I've never watched Game of Thrones, but I know people talk about winter a lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're going to get like a really good uh, April, and then it's going to be over for the summer. That's, That's going to be it. It's uh, all deserve. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, I'm happy to welcome back Steve Napper, contributing editor of Rolling Stone and author of Appetite for Self-Destruction. So hi, Steve, and uh, thanks for coming back. How's it going? Hey, good. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, today we have a bunch of story to stories to discuss as usual. I actually thought it was a fairly s- slow news week uh, on Monday when I started putting the show notes together, but it turns out uh, that it's actually not that much of a slow week, so uh, a lot of stuff to go through. And, uh, you know, today I wanted to start the show by talking about a story that we actually discussed last week. Uh, uh, but finally, after a few months of discussions on, on the potential verdict and what was going to happen uh, with uh, Redigi, we have a resolution uh, in the Redigi versus Capital Records case. Uh, so, you know, to give a, a super short summary, Redigi is a company that pioneered the idea of reselling digital music and planned to expand into all sorts of digital goods, including books and videos. So the plan was always slightly problematic because uh, the licenses that govern uh, the purchases on, on, on uh, iTunes, uh, for example, clearly state that the buyer doesn't actually own the track outright. It's more of a, of a license situation. But the company was planning to leverage the first sale doctrine to supersede that license, uh, uh, that limitation, and allow you users to proceed selling the tracks um, uh, digitally. So reselling the tracks digitally um, for, for a better wording. So of course it didn't take long for the plan to attract a lawsuit from, from a label. That label in this case was Capital Records uh, and we have been waiting for the outcome of this uh, of this uh, lawsuit for uh, almost a year now I think. And uh, Judge Richard Sullivan from a New York district court uh, ruled that Redigi is infringing on Capital Records uh, copyright as the technology implemented does make a copy of the recording simply by transmitting it uh, over the internet and that in itself is a violation of copyright law. So this is a pretty clear-cut judgment that sets a precedent in the area. So first of all, uh, Steve, w- w- were you expecting this outcome, uh, especially coming from a US perspective? I guess I'm not too surprised by it. I, it it's I, I don't totally understand all the legal ins and outs of the case, but um, it, it seems like the idea that somebody could continue copying a song that's sold over iTunes strikes me as, as more consistent with the legal rulings that we've seen with Napster and some of the other P2P situations. You know, we're talking about, um, it seems like there's a distinction between reselling a CD at a used CD store versus copying a CD onto a cassette tape or whatever it is, and then selling that. Those are two different things. And again, I'm no legal expert, but it seems to me that the judge is ruling, and I'm not, you know, uh, this is different from my personal philosophy over, or, or independent of my personal philosophy over, over copyright sure. um, infringement. But uh, it seems to me the judge's ruling is consistent with the way courts have interpreted um, copies of digital music, pristine copies over the years. So yeah. I, I'm not surprised, I guess I should yeah. say. And Eamon, this uh, kind of has a, a bit of a repercussion in Europe as well, just because Redigi was planning to expand into Europe. But if the company is liable to pay a huge amount of damages, I mean, the, the court hasn't decided what kind of damages it's going to have to pay to capital. Uh, but if that's the case, then the company might not actually be able to survive the, the ruling. So uh, yeah. do you think it had a chance in the UK to, to go ahead with this plan? Or would it have been challenged in kind of the same way? 
I, th- I think certainly it would have been challenged in the same way because uh, the copyright owners, particularly the record companies, would want to lock down uh, really hard on this sort of thing. But I, I guess that the approach they were taking was, I don't know if it was playing fast and loose with the law intentionally or if they wanted, if they were kind of sacrificing themselves to get a wider debate about ownership of, of digital rights because there was that kind of non-story last yeah. year about Bruce Willis's kids not going to inherit yeah. his digital music collection which and it turned out that that wasn't real but that uh it raised a wider issue about ownership and do you actually own this stuff so i think there's there's a wider point there about uh what we as consumers own when we pay for it uh and and download it but i think that, that this whole idea of of being able to sell on something it seems a bit weird because just the business model do you have to buy somebody's complete digital collection could you cherry pick it or was it just kind of sight unseen which uh uh, I guess you could uh, find a lot of jams there, but I'm sure you would find lots of terrible, terrible things yeah. uh, in their uh, record collection. And how can they prove that that person doesn't have any other copies of that? I think that, yeah. uh, that there's there's an issue here about being able to sell on secondhand products, be it a, an LP or a book or a DVD or whatever, because the, it's it's about scarcity. There's a finite number of those products have been uh, produced in the market. So they can collect or they can kind of inherit a collector's interest, be it a first edition Dickens or a original mono pressing of Rubber Soul or whatever. But once you go into the realms of digital music, those those files can be uh, infinitely duplicated. There's no deterioration in sound from one MP3 uh, to the next. Yeah. So this whole idea of uh, kind of taking somebody's collection but they no longer own it, even though they potentially could have that collection backed up on a hard drive or on a series of uh, DVDs uh, was quite nebulous. So I think yeah. I think the, the basic principles of the business model were quite odd. I, I just thought it was one of those uh, services that just come howling in uh, out of nowhere and just scream, please sue me. It was just yeah. absolutely That's one of those impressive. situations. So yeah. I don't know. I don't know if they genuinely thought they were going to get away with it or change the law. But I think it's it raises a fundamental point about ownership, which I think is really important. Uh, but I think they could have raised that point uh, more directly and certainly more cost effectively than uh, what they're going to end up paying in terms of what capital's looking for in in, in their damages and the hours yeah. in damages as well. Of course, and and uh, I think like it, uh, to be honest, the industries that are actually going to breathe a, a bigger sigh of relief than the music industry because you know I don't, I don't think it was ever going to be like a huge market for for music in in that sense it's probably the the book and film industries where there was probably going to be a wider market for this sort of second hand passing along of of uh, of articles uh, I, I, rather than in the music industry where you know people are getting used to the rental model with music and, and yeah. it might not be quite as appealing I think the consumption is completely different because you buy a, a song, and if you really like that song, you will play it forever. You will play it for 50 years or however long you live. But even if you really love a movie, you maybe watch it five times, ten times at most. Of the, These are the films that I've watched inside out and could quote endlessly. Yeah. And books, I can't think of a book that I've read more than twice. So they, they have a, a kind of use once function, and they they kind of look, nice on yourself to, to show how cultured you are but yeah. they sit there collecting dust whereas your record collection will be dug out it will be replayed again and again so i can see why there's a market for things like uh pre-watch films if you want yeah. and, I, and i suppose that ties into the whole idea of uh libraries and video dvd rental stores as well we don't have a uh, cd rental culture here they do in japan but certainly not in in Europe, and I guess it's the same in the US. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Steve, uh, on, on your side, the, the, you know, you are an author as well. So, uh, were you more worried about this going through, or you know, would you have? Do you think publishers would have been more concerned about this going through uh, than the the labels if if this uh, if this ruling had been different? Well, first of all, I think everybody's read my book at least twice, so. Oh, I've read it five times. Of course. <laughs> uh, but, uh, sorry, I couldn't I actually, I actually did have to read it twice because I was reviewing it, so... <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, thank you. Okay. I didn't realize. Okay, excellent. Thanks. So I wasn't fishing for compliments there, but... No, uh, I, I, give, I give it a very good review. Thank you. Um, so, in any case, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that... I guess the, I would just need it a little bit more legally clarified. The stories that I've read about this haven't quite made this crystal clear for no. me um, in that... 
you know, what constitutes a legal copy of, an, of something online that you could sell versus selling a used CD in a store? I mean, obviously, we, we would probably all agree and most lawyers would agree that if you're going to resell a, C, a physical CD in a used CD store, that's certainly legal fair use. But if you're going to buy something off of Amazon Kindle or iTunes Music Store or whatever, you know, and, and then turn around and sell that pristine digital copy to someone else, that seemed, I mean, as, as Amon was, was suggesting, I mean, that seems like a, holding up a sign that says, sue me. That seems very dubious to me. Yeah. And so it seems common sense. Um, the distinction there seems commonsensical to me, but legally speaking, I would really love to see kind of a clarification of that. I, I don't know um, copyright law and, and, and the ins and outs of it to be able to really register the difference there. Yeah, yeah of course. Uh, well, uh, I'll move on from this because I, I mean, uh, we've discussed uh, this story at length on the show, so uh, there's no point dwelling on it too, 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 too much longer. And I just wanted to mention about uh, the passing of one of the industry's most respected producers uh, this week, uh, Phil Ramon, who was 82 years old and uh, has produced some of the most incredible records. I mean, I, I was... Uh, reading his credits, you know, for example, there's uh, Simon and Garfunkel's uh, Central Park concert, which was, uh, for me was a huge, uh, huge important record, like when I was listening to it when I was, uh, when I was young. And, uh, uh, you know, I just thought it was important to mention it. He was very important on the, on the music technology side as well, having released uh, in 1982 uh, what's regarded as the first really big pop record to come out on CD, which was uh, our issue of uh, Billy Joel's 52nd Street. And he also made important strides in the uh, surround sound uh, world and won a Grammy in that, in that, in that uh, respect uh, on Ray Charles' uh, Genius Love Company release. Uh, so, you know, it's kind of hard to comment on this kind of news, but I just wanted to ask you guys if there's any particular release uh, that he produced or anything that you're particularly attached to, uh, Eamon? Well, I, 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 uh, when he died, I, I looked at uh, his Wikipedia feed, uh, uh, page. I don't know how much tr uh, trust you can put in a Wikipedia page, but yeah. I looked at the the enormous list of albums that uh, he was involved with, and and the one that really jumped out for me, and he wasn't a producer on it. I think he just worked as an engineer on it. Was Dylan's uh, Blood on the Tracks, yeah. which is a phenomenal album, and I'm I'm a massive Dylan fan, and I'm a massive Dylan apologist for all those terrible albums and all those terrible live performances <laughs> but uh there, there's something there's something about blood on the tracks there's a real there's a real depth and a real warmth to the sound that he doesn't that he never captured on any other album he, he talked about this thin wild mercury sound in relation to his uh, that was the ideal sound he had when he was recording uh blonde on blonde but i think uh blood on the tracks is probably his best produced album and best engineered album it just it seems to fit together really well there's a real all the instruments really shine uh, he'd he'd taken a whole new approach to songwriting and lyric writing at the time as well and i just think it was like certainly it's it's, it's unarguable that that was his best album of the of the 1970s without without a doubt so yeah. i think i think just for his involvement on on that one album i think that's his 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 place is is assured among the greats yeah yeah steve on your, on your side anything yeah, a little bit. Um, I, you know, I, I concur. I mean, uh, and I'm also a Dylan apologist. So, um, but it's a tough uh, life, isn't it? Yes, it, it really is. I, I have a nephew who is a, uh, a an opera percussionist and um, is incredibly well trained. And he's always complaining about Dylan's voice and and his arrangements are not that complex and so forth. And the yeah. other day we were talking about some. My nephew is, uh, you know, a, a, an amazing musician. He's really great, and he's 26. And um, sorry, I'm I'm sagging into a, a, a Dylan. A Dylan aside here, but uh, fine. so I played him um, stuck inside of Mobile with the with the Memphis Blues again, and he, uh, you know, he 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 still said the arrangements were not that complex for him, but um, you know, he said, "Whoa, Shakespeare's in the alley. That's amazing." You know that kind of thing. Yeah. But in any case, back to Phil Ramone. Sorry, um, I actually was was uh, honored and lucky enough to interview uh, Mr. Ramone um, for for my book, um, and I, I quoted him at one point because he turned out to be. Um, fairly influential in uh, in the adoption of the the compact disc um, and and digital music more specifically and digital recording um, and it you know it's it's hard to remember these days but in the in the late seventies early eighties when Philips and Sony were pushing the CD and trying to get everybody to change from analog to digital there was a, a a massive resistance among recording engineers and producers and and record labels and and they were worried not only about piracy but the things that we all hear about today which is that you know we would lose that great warm sound from a from an LP um that we used to have that was that was a concern at the time too but but 
um, Mr. Ramon actually stood up for digital recording. You know, he he was Billy Joel's producer, famously, and um, the the very first album to be uh, to be remastered digitally, I believe, um, was Billy Joel's album The Stranger. Um, and and so it was it was Ramon who was behind that, and he he told me some things that sort of, you know, um, he, he said uh, the quote he gave me was. It was what I was wanting to happen. It was as you hear it in the control room. Um, he loved the idea that you could just record something in a studio um, pristinely without having to do all these you know, cumbersome tricks in order to make it sound like what you wanted it to sound like. With digital recording, you could really record it in this incredibly pristine way. And he, as a, as a guy who was known for his pristine sound, was, was attracted to that. Yeah. Um, and so I think that that's something that, you know, obviously the, the obituaries that we've read, um, as you guys have suggested, have, have uh, listed all his amazing works and all the people he's worked with and all the stuff he's done and his style, which was very Quincy Jones-esque kind of hands off and let the artists do their thing and, and only push them with when you have to, which is, I think, the hallmark of a, of a great producer. Um, but I think that this is a, a really important footnote to his career that, that, that's maybe been overlooked, which is yeah. that he was one of the pioneers that ushered the transition from analog to digital from a recording perspective, from an artist and producer perspective. And I, and I think that that was one great thing that he did. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Well, thanks. Thanks for that. And uh, cool. Let's move on to uh, like just uh, a quick news that came up uh, just a couple of hours ago uh, and uh, talking about uh, YouTube and uh, SASIM or SASIM, depending on how you pronounce it, which is the uh, French collection society for, for authors and, in, and songwriters. And uh, finally, uh, it looks like uh, SASIM and YouTube have reached a deal, uh, which kind of goes via um, and, and includes a universal music publishing uh, uh, repertoire uh, via this uh, direct Administration licensing initiative that uh, UMPG and uh, SASM had put together to sort of facilitate licensing internationally and uh, and make things a little bit smoother when it comes to these sort of deals. Uh, and the deal covers 127 territories, which is uh, uh, a lot, of course, it, it, you know, the majority of territories, and it represents a major win for Google because, of course, uh, uh, SASM and Gamma were two of the biggest holdouts in terms of collection societies for uh, for the company. Uh, so. Uh, you know, of course, a, a big win for 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 Sasim and, uh, uh, and and for Google because I'm sure that Sasim won't have agreed to rates that weren't particularly agreeable to them. Uh, so I, I don't know. Gamma now becomes the only holdout uh, in Europe, as far as I'm aware, in terms of uh, deals that are being made with the collection societies. Uh, Steve, uh, I, do you have any any thoughts on? Uh, YouTube's sort of strides in Europe and whether they're going to find uh, find it easier now uh, with this deal to get things uh, accomplished. You know, um, I, it, this is kind of not my area. I, I don't cover Europe too much, so, of course. so I think I sh I'll have to uh, yeah. sort of sort of pass on this one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, Amon, uh, you've you've covered, I'm sure, this this side of things uh, or write about it quite a oh, bit uh, between music oh, yeah, in bits and pieces it, when you get into the the issues of publishers and uh, and deals like that they always seem to take a, a backseat in terms of the headlines you always hear about record companies and you never really hear much about the publishers but I think obviously there, there's a real kind of uh, bittersweet relationship between copyright holders and Google and YouTube in particular. YouTube just announced recently that it's got uh, a billion uh, unique users globally and it claims that that's one in every two people who are online. I think that, that was the real kind of uh, stop you in the tracks figure as far as I was concerned, just in terms of the sheer reach. So... YouTube's an incredibly, incredibly important promotional channel for all of these copyright owners. It's not necessarily an important uh, monetization channel, or certainly not at the rates that they would like. But there's, there is that real tension of do if they cut stuff off, uh, as Gamma have done in Germany, it, is that really just damaging their, their long-term market? Are they holding out for this uh, kind of utopian royalty rate, but missing out on kind of three, four, five years, however long uh, the negotiations happened? They're missing out on those incremental royalties. I don't know which is better because uh, I think, obviously, people don't want Google to steamroller over rights, but... Yeah. 
but Google has put various things in place which are incredibly, incredibly useful and used a lot by the copyright holders. So it's it's very difficult to say that Google is inherently bad or inherently good for the music industry. It's fantastic as a promotional platform. It's not necessarily good as a, as a source of revenue. And that's the tension that all copyright holders are really having to uh, try and reconcile in their negotiations with, uh, with Google and particularly with YouTube. Obviously, Companies like uh, Vivo have kind of stepped in, which is a partnership between uh, Sony and Universal and Abu Dhabi Media, to try and increase the revenues by going away from the UGC side of things and yeah. and putting emphasis on uh, the premium side of things. But for most people, YouTube is now a verb. So consumers, for consumers, video online is YouTube. So you can build up Vivo as much as you want. You can promote it as high definition or whatever else. The way that people consume music is on YouTube. It's uh, Ian Rogers from uh, Top Spin and Daisy always describes it as the biggest music player in the world, and it is. So I think there is there is a real need that copyright holders are monetized, but I think. We also have to factor in the promotional benefits of it as well. So it's yeah. a very difficult thing to pin down and say Absolutely. it's great or it's terrible because it's it's a kind of it's chameleon as a business partner. It'll it'll kind of kiss you and it'll stab you at the same time. <laughs> so I don't know if that's their intention, but uh, that's yeah. the reality of Google. And just in terms of the sheer influence it has, certainly uh, I know in the US it spends a lot of money lobbying uh, Congress. I think more than the record companies do to kind of get its. Position across, yeah. and I think the the days of action that uh, around uh, Sopa and Pippa in the US as well, it was it was kind of a very key player in in a lot of that as well. So it's it's got yeah. a huge amount of political influence, and it's but more than that, it's got a huge amount of cultural influence, and that's the issue that copyright holders still need to kind of figure out how they how they best work with YouTube because they can't work completely against YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, of course, and, and I'm, I'm going to talk more about uh, these issues the next week. I'm going to have an interview with uh, uh, the guys from uh, C3S, which is uh, an alternative collection society that is trying to set up a shop in uh, Germany as an alternative to, to Gema. Uh, so, you know, I'm going to hear their side of things and, and how they, they feel about the YouTube Gema situation as well. As an aside, I will tell you an interesting uh, anecdote or a quote about Gema where uh, an unnamed senior... Uh, digital person in the music business was asked about uh, Gema and about the fact that they wouldn't necessarily uh, license stuff and they said what 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 can you do and uh, their argument was said we just have to sit and wait out until the board all die because they're all really old so we're just waiting for them all <laughs> to slowly die so that we can actually move things on a bit but, uh, I'm not surprised yeah so uh, that person will unfortunately have to remain nameless for legal <laughs> reasons of course that's great all right. Well, um, uh, just talking about YouTube and uh, just uh, with a very weak segue, uh, talking about charts and how YouTube, you know, has been recently integrated in the Billboard charts uh, uh, in, the, in the Hot 100 to, to count towards uh, that uh, all important number one ranking, which contributed to Bauer's uh, fairly long reign. I think it was uh, four or five weeks uh, at the top of that of that chart. Uh, so I, I just want to talk about charts generally. There isn't really a piece of news around those, but we've been talking about charts a lot on the show recently, especially looking at the Timberlake uh, uh, numbers and, and uh, everything around that and uh, looking at what role the charts are really playing in, in, in 2013, how the charts are evolving and how they need to evolve. So uh, looking at the uh, US side first, uh, you know, I know that Billboard has done a lot uh, to try and integrate uh, streams and the different types of, of usage, like for example, on Pandora, iHeartRadio, and other mediums into, into their uh, accounts. And uh, uh, and they've sh sh they shook up things a couple of times last year, and uh, and they've also d done some more integrations this year, as I was mentioning with the, with the YouTube uh, account. So, so uh, Steve, you do a, a weekly uh, column on charts, uh, so of course very much involved in this in this type of the type of thing. Uh, what are your feelings on charts? Do you think that the mainstream chart is still as relevant as it was? Do you feel like uh, uh, more niche charts on specific genres are becoming more important? Uh, what's the deal in the US? Um. Yeah, I mean, I, the Hot 100, I think, is really interesting now. You know, I, I supported the idea of, of putting the YouTube data and the other data in there. Um, I thought that was a good decision. I thought that it kept the charts more relevant. You know, all the things that the Billboard people said, I, I basically agreed with. Um, you know, I, I like this uh, 
I, and I use it frequently in my column. Um, I like the the Big Champagne Ultimate chart, um, which really tracks uh, YouTube data more specifically, and and kind of makes a, an effort to kind of um, break out radio data versus sales data versus YouTube and other online and friends and followers and that kind of thing. And so I love. I think more data is good. Um, you know, it's interesting that the Harlem Shake phenomenon obviously was the immediate beneficiary of that change. Um, and, and like you said, uh, lasted four or five weeks. I think it just dropped to number two um, this, this most recent week to, uh, to thrift shop. Um, and, but otherwise, unless I'm missing something, it doesn't seem to have shaken the charts up too much, at least for now. Yeah. Um, the stuff that you see on there is the stuff you'd see anyway. You know, Justin which, Timberlake which, and Rihanna and, and so just, forth. Just out of interest, uh, I guess was all the different iterations of Harlem Shake kind of towards the charts. Is that right? Because there, there isn't really an original one. There was everybody had done their own version. So I guess yeah, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, yeah, I, you're right. There, there isn't an original one. Although I think there's like a there's a non-video audio track of it, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But yeah, that, that is a good question. I mean, um, I guess I, it's a, yeah. I, 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 I vaguely, you know, I covered this a few weeks ago, and I haven't checked on that question recently. But and I could be wrong, but I vaguely remember that Billboard clarified that, and I think they did in fact say that all the different versions. Um, I would think so, yeah. But, right, yeah. yeah but again, they, they, they were all using the exact same master recording. It was just yeah, they, yeah, they right, done exactly. their own their own meme video for, around that. So and they, right, and, and certainly and that, that, that counts that counts for the YouTube royalties. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for, for yeah. the publishing royalties, you know. And the thing, you have think that. Buyer had claimed all of those, hadn't he? Hadn't he kind of gone out of his way to claim every single iteration yeah. of, of that video? Yeah. yeah, exactly. Which is yeah. why, isn't there, well, there's a, a kind of sample case. Is that still going on? Is it two two different people are taking legal action against them for... Oh, for samples. Some, yeah, I, I haven't found so. that. I don't know about the sample right. case. Yeah, I, 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 I don't know if that's been resolved or not yet. Or, yeah, I, I read that I read that somewhere, but I'm, I'm sure it, it will be resolved uh, behind closed doors. I, I would imagine they would. everybody concerned is probably... More, <laughs> more well, than well, willing to settle. It's that, old, it's that old maxim where there's a hit, there's a writ. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, so in the U.S., it, it kind of, it's cool because Billboard as an organization has taken a lot of steps to ensure that the charts stay up up to speed with what's happening as well in the social media space. Uh, in the U.K., Eamon, uh, I was just looking at some of the press releases from the past year and a half from the official charts company, and it doesn't seem like there's been a, a lot of change as, as far as the tracking of sales is concerned. Uh, it's all very compartmentalized. You know, they, they launched the streaming chart, I think it was May last year. Yeah. Uh, but aside from that, there hasn't been a, a whole lot of, of change as, as far as the official charts is, is concerned. Do you think Think that they're still as relevant as they were, and, and does it need to to really uh, adapt a little bit more to, to what's happening on, on the streaming front, for example? Well, to, to, to put this in, in context, because the, the US chart was always a kind of delicate balance between sales and radio play, so adding in streams and things like that is it's it's part of that evolution in the US that that's been happening. It's been a, it's it's adapted to change the US. Or sorry, the UK chart has always been sales based, yeah. and for a long time, even when the downloads uh, uh, started to impact, there was a standalone download chart, and then downloads would only count towards the chart if there was a concurrent physical release, and then eventually it got to the point where you didn't need a concurrent physical release, and now we're at the stage where it's 97, 98 percent of single sales in the UK are as downloads. They introduced a uh, streaming chart last year, standalone chart. They need to figure out uh, the weighting, how many streams equals uh, a download and I don't know if they, they, they work this out in purely monetary value or not yeah. but I think the, the UK chart has always stayed sales based they did make one uh, I think potentially significant change to the charts which was triggered in part by the, uh, the most recent David Bowie album because it's about redemption tracks because when he released the uh, Where Are We Now single ahead of the album, yep. people were able to buy the album, pre-order the album on iTunes and get the, that as the first kind of teaser single. And yep. that didn't count towards the charts in that week. Yep. But they've now amended the uh, the chart rules so that if you pre-order uh, an album and get a track ahead of release, that track now counts towards the charts. But I think, certainly based... Right. 
based on what's happening in the US, it, it, oh, the UK chart seems very kind of analog in a way. It seems yeah. very fixed in a, you buy stuff and it goes up the chart. So maybe that's a very pure way to uh, present the chart. But I think just as a, as a representation of consumption, I think we have to, the, the chart will have to evolve. It's yeah. not just about ownership. It's about access. It's about listening uh, these days, whether or not they incorporate radio play into that, I'm not sure. But if they're if they're looking purely at uh, digital music services or music uh, retailers as well, they're going to have to include Spotify and YouTube and Vivo and whoever else. Otherwise, it's only a partial chart. It, it captures a large part of consumer behaviour at the moment. But fast forward to 2023. Yeah. And that will look really, really antediluvian to have kind of just focused purely on sales, I think, anyway. But then yeah. uh, it, it's really up to the official charts company, which is co-owned by uh, the record companies and the retailers in the UK. It, it's, yeah. it's split between ERA, which represents the uh, retailers, and the BPI, which is... I guess our equivalent of your RIAA in the states. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sure. it, of course, there, there are interests to play. In yeah, it's it's got to placate labels and it's got to placate, uh, placate retailers. And I think it was it was difficult for them to get uh, downloads factored into the charts anyway because uh, board uh, uh, era's name at the time had no digital members on the board, and then eventually they had to adapt and and get uh, digital retailers on the board, and then they they made. Uh, pretty progressive strides but I think you've still got two sets of parties who uh, perhaps might not be so keen for the chart to evolve quite so quickly because exactly. that pulls the rug slightly from under their authority on the high street. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Of course, and uh, talking about uh, sort of uh, the influence uh, in within the industry, I just wanted to look quickly at an interview that Billboard published with uh, Charles Caldas from Merlin. Uh, so Merlin has been uh, in the headlines quite a bit recently, actually, because you know they've taken a, a fairly uh, prominent stance on specific cases, uh, for example, in, in, in MySpace, they were very vocal about, uh, and rightly so, about the usage of, uh, of uh, Merlin uh, uh, releases uh, from, from Merlin labels uh, on, uh, on MySpace without, uh, without license. Uh, they also talked about uh, the Songla uh, service in Australia that launched uh, uh, without uh, doing uh, deals with Merlin, um, uh, which of course uh, cuts up cuts off a, a huge part of of, uh, of of catalog from from any streaming service uh, not having the any of the, of the Merlin tracks on there, and so um, you know. Um, Charles Callas did, um, received uh, the Impala Outstanding Contribution Award uh, last week, and uh, so in this interview he made he made some pretty interesting remarks in regards to Universal Music, uh, especially as it stands after the EMI merger. And uh, he quoted uh, Lucian Grange as uh, stating that you know power is the ability to stop new services, and power power is the ability to create new services. And of course, with a huge market share and back catalog, Universal can certainly dictate some interesting terms in the licensing deals. So, uh, you know, keeping in mind that the uh, the restriction that they had in Europe on uh, not being able to ask for most favored nations uh, terms, it, it's just a European restriction. It doesn't apply to anywhere else in the world. Uh, so, you know, UMG has also invested in a number of different streaming services, uh, as, as Carlos points out, and that makes them both a competitor to Merlin and also a retailer of Merlin's own uh, material on, on those particular platforms. So, uh, it's, it's kind of a conflict there, and it's interesting to see, you know, Merlin really putting their foot down and, and pointing that out uh, in the first place. And that's not the only conflict that we see. You know, of course, uh, Warner is now going to have uh, a big tie with uh, with uh, Daisy since the investors in the company are, are the same people. Uh, so yeah. uh, I don't know, what's your take on this kind of weird conflict of interest that's starting to take place between being a, a content owner and an investor in a startup that or, or in a technology company that uh, uh, distributes that content and, and, uh, and allows access to that? Uh, Steve, I'm going to yield on this one too. This is this is a European thing that I haven't been following so much. So yeah. so go for it. And on on the Warner side, anything any comment on that in terms of like you know how how do you feel about a label being so heavily involved in the in the investment, for example, uh, side of a of a digital service? Do you think that it, it can yield some influence on that front, or is it just a question of chance of the investors being the same coming from the same source? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, all I can say on that is just sort of the basic thing. I mean, the the labels are heavily invested in in streaming services. They made these incredible investments in Spotify, and they yeah. obviously are looking to these as being the the future of the business. So, you know, it's not it's not surprising to me. Um, the the conflict of interest and and that sort of thing is something that I haven't been keeping up with yeah. very much. Yeah. yeah, well, I think from, from Warner's perspective, or from, from Len Blavatnik's perspective more specifically, uh, and his company, he's now he's got an investment in three uh, different streaming services. Spotify, which was a, a deal that predates his ownership, but I think it was under the, the Bronkman reign uh, at Warner's. And obviously now he's invested in Beats slash Daisy, and he's also uh, now the major investor in Deezer as well, which is... Yeah. Uh, kind of uh, expanded internationally. So does that suggest that it's a spread bet for him or is that a kind of vote of no confidence in some of those services or does he feel that all of these need uh, a cash injection to go mainstream which will benefit uh, all services because uh, uh, there is an argument that by investing in these services, it's putting them in front of the whole market and you're not just hearing Warner content on any of those services, you're hearing lots of other content on there. But going back to Charles Caldas's comments, the one thing I was particularly intrigued about was his uh, criticism of the clique, which I don't know if you know about this, Steve, but it's a new uh, mobile uh, service in uh, Africa, which is a joint venture between Universal Music International and Samsung. And it's free uh, at the moment, and it may be funded for by ads or whatever, but it's not just a universal catalog. They're licensing in other labels. They've got local labels in there. And Charles Caldas talked about uh, the fact that uh, they will have to license their stuff into the clique and then that Universal will ultimately make money off this if the clique is profitable. But there is an argument to say that uh, Universal, by making that major investment, is bringing the indies into Africa when there is no real digital market there. iTunes only launched in South Africa in December last year. And I think they've got Simfi, which is a German streaming service, and yes. that's by it in uh, in Africa. So they're actually, if you're if you're if you're talking about emerging markets, they've they've made a significant step here in investing in a service in this in uh, the African continent, which yeah. will benefit uh, all labels. So obviously they've made the investment, so they should. To a degree, uh, if there's if there's a financial upside, they should benefit from making that investment. So I don't think that uh, maybe Charles Caldas's quotes were taken slightly out of context, but yeah. just to think that the evil the evil empire of Universal was riding roughshod over the Indies. Uh, uh, Rights and and revenues and so forth. It's actually put its money where its mouth is, and it's invested in a market where even major players, up until a matter of months ago, Apple was wouldn't have hadn't gone into uh, Africa until four months ago. Yeah. So yeah. this this is a really nascent market. So I think that's that's a significant move by Universal. You can you can talk about that as them building up their. Uh, their presence and, uh, and and creating more power and tilting the balance more in their favour, or you could see it as something as an investment that does potentially benefit other rights holders, not exclusively Universal. And without wanting to uh, disparage Merlin and uh, the independent sector, I don't see them investing in startup services to the same extent to create these uh, opportunities for themselves and and for others. So. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it all gets a little bit animal farm. Uh, yeah, sure. So yeah, and, hear about, and, uh, about uh, uh, who's in the right and the wrong here. But I think that yeah. I think there's the it's 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 part of Universal's growth strategy, absolutely. But I don't think it can be dismissed as an entirely bad thing. Yeah. I think there are there are there is an upside for other companies, and they are licensing in indie in indie content, which they don't have many other digital outlets without that. Yeah, and I guess like uh, looking at, I guess like Merlin's perspective at this point is that looking at the numbers that they're making when it comes to streaming, for example, where they have a huge amount of streams, and uh, uh, looking at their prominence really in, in the in the in, in the marketplace, they are placing themselves as like a, a new major of sorts in the sense that, that you know the collection of independents can create a poll that has as much weight as. Uh, one of the majors, which is, I guess, the their point in trying to make sure that every time there is a company that doesn't take Merlin into account or doesn't do a deal with Merlin, they point that out and they make sure that that gets out in the press, right? Mm. 
Yeah, no, I think absolutely. I think uh, any company that doesn't treat uh, the independents collectively as being worth as much as the majors, I think, has is on a hiding to nothing. I think they need to uh, negotiate equally with all of them. And But the thing is that uh, Merlin, uh, it's not compulsory for independent label. I think it's an opt-in thing with yep. Merlin, so that certain labels will opt out of the Merlin deal and negotiate directly. I know, uh, as I understand a beggar's grip, do that. They they negotiate deals directly. I would imagine so so. Uh, it's, it's a set number of independent labels that would necessarily be included in a Merlin deal. So you still have to do, you will still have to do some of the bigger independent deals yeah. directly as well. So it's not, Merlin is, is not entirely a one-stop shop for all indie rights. It's one-stop shop for a lot of indie rights, but not all of them. Whereas if you do a deal with um, Universal, you get all the Universal sub-labels. And if you do a deal with Sony, the exact same. But they, the market isn't as fragmented as it was like 15 years ago before the formation of AIM and A2IM and other organizations like that. So there is no real justification for services coming into the market and just completely ignoring the independents. I think they, they, they should have the independents there from lunch because uh, they might not always have the huge international hits, but they've got, they'll have the stuff that lots of kind of music obsessives will want as yeah. well. So, And if you don't have the independence, you've got a massively incomplete service, So, yeah. and it's just a bad user experience. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, uh, moving on, uh, you know, whilst uh, North Korea is firing off threats of nuclear war, South Korea is currently dealing with the less than stellar results from its Three Strikes initiative that launched in 2009 and was hailed as one of the most, uh, you know, uh, Progressive, I guess. Uh, I don't know. Uh, uh, one of the pioneering, I guess, uh, laws in in the three strikes uh, domain, uh, whereby a user would be uh, advised of their infringement uh, for three times uh, until their internet connection is uh, is uh, severed. Uh, so. Um, the reports from Digital Music News are that uh, uh, the graduated response has uh, spiraled out of control, uh, distributing over half a million notices and closing down the internet service of uh, over 408 users, uh, most of which, as pointed out, are uh, online storage services or our users were where the transaction has not been more than uh, 90 cents in, in valuation in terms of what was downloaded. So uh, it, lo it looks like, you know, the uh, the Human Rights uh, National Assembly in Korea uh, has also stepped in, uh, announcing plans uh, for, for a law that would repeal this uh, three, strike, um, three strikes measure. And, uh, uh, you know, of course, there's going to be lobbying on the, on, the, on the rights holder's part to, to prevent that from happening. But it doesn't look like this experiment went really well at all. And uh, uh, adding to this the fact that it hasn't really acted as a, as a deterrent uh, in the sense that it doesn't look like people are pirating less in South Korea than they were before, uh, it really seems like, you know, a bit of a death toll for the Three Strikes initiatives. And I haven't really heard anything else uh, in other countries happening on, on the same side. I mean, in the UK, we haven't really heard much new about that uh, act that was supposed to come into place, right? Well, it's it's still it's still being parked because uh, they're they're dealing with uh, Ofcom, the media regulator, about how to implement it, and that was, it was pushed in before the last general election, which was two years ago, three years ago. It's been it's been sitting inert for a long time, so yeah. nothing's quite happened there. There is the Hadopi law in France. I think yeah. that only led to one court action or something, and exactly. there's, there's a lot of talk <laughs> about that. Uh, the funding being cut, and it seems to have it seems to have kind of misfired on quite a lot of levels. Yeah. Uh, but I know it, it, the U.S. has just introduced the six strikes. Is that right, or this this kind of quite protracted six strikes? Oh, I haven't heard uh, about that. Yeah, I haven't heard about the six strikes. No, I don't know about that. Oh right, okay. Maybe I've maybe I've misread it because that was a kind of uh, variation or a kind of slightly defined version of uh, of SOPA. Yeah. Which I think is it's going to be a much longer process, but right. uh, yeah, I don't know the whole that whole thing just seems quite strange to me yeah. because I know that uh, they're now targeting the, the kind of companies who advertise on torrent sites or peer-to-peer -peer sites, and I think that's probably much more effective because. Uh, 
it, it you kind of you cut off the funding for them, and then uh, they, they won't actually kind of be in business anymore. Because uh, despite all their arguments for kind of freedom of information, whatever else, they are commercial enterprises, and uh, the people who uh, run these things can make significant sums of money. But I think they they it's just. It's a very difficult thing to PR, this kind of three strikes thing, because it's kind of open to abuse, it's open to misinterpretation. Uh, I think it's the, one of the arguments is that it's the onus is on the accused to prove their innocence rather than the accusers to prove their guilt, which seems an absolute reverse of the fundamentals of, uh, of kind of law. Yeah. Uh, in in terms of uh, uh, convictions and things like that, so yeah. and the music industry is quite hated by people anyway. So I think this is this is just another thing that makes them look like bullies and awful, terrible people. So I think <laughs> just the the way it's been handled has been really bad. I fundamentally believe that copyright should be protected and the people that. Uh, benefit or financially benefit over the the kind of the illegal exploitation of uh, copyright should be convicted. But I think getting that across to Joe and Josephine public is quite difficult, and I think that that's the whole system is is kind of set up for abuse on lots of different sides. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a real need for regulation here, but then. The problem is, do you over-regulate it so it doesn't actually do anything? And basically, people just uh, go around in circles. And uh, I've not seen kind of a, a fact of use of this yet. Maybe, yeah. maybe it works as a psychological deterrent. I don't know. But if, if you want to kind of boil it down to empirical facts, it becomes very difficult to prove. Yeah. It becomes a very long-winded... It's a very yeah. long-winded way of making a deterrent to have to go through this whole uh, legislative yeah. process to actually just do a deterrent. Just a couple of points on this about the U.S. I mean, I think in general, the U.S. Congress has been, as we saw from the downfall of SOPA and PIPA last year, has been reluctant to be sort of an enforcement arm of the entertainment industry as far as, as copyright infringement is concerned. Yeah. Um, I think the courts have certainly been willing to, to make precedents over the years, as we've seen. Um, but I, I think that lawmakers are sort of, you know, reluctant to jump into the fray after they see, you know, how much record labels in the movie industry has been bashed for being the big bad bully who's punitively trying to, you know, sue six-year-old kids for, for file sharing and all these things over the years. You know, I think Joe Senator or Josephine Senator in whatever state or whatever representative in whatever state is reluctant to sort of be on the side of, of the big record labels on that. So it, it's almost like they've sort of, you know, I guess the expression is kick the can down the road. They don't, they don't really particularly want to get involved in that. And then um, the other thing I would just note is that um, I think your observation in this article that you sent, the observation about how in South Korea uh, these these punitive three strikes ideas um, have not deter deterred piracy. Um, and in fact, it, it seems to be going up. Um, I thought it was interesting to note that the, the NPD group figures came out in the U.S. recently that showed over the last two years um, illegal peer-to-peer -peer file, share, file sharing has gone down significantly, um, according to their surveys. Um, and, and I really don't think that that is, I mean, I guess you could, the record industry talks about how that's a result of shutting down LimeWire and the Pirate Bay to an extent and, and that sort of thing. But I really think that the reason for that is just finally, over the last three, four, five years, um, we've started to see services where you can get music cheaply and reasonably, Spotify and, and legitimate services and so forth, YouTube, and people don't really need to go out and, and do the cumbersome piracy as much as they did five or certainly 10 years ago. Yeah. So I really think that, the, you know, it's important to get those precedents in court about the copyright infringement and so forth, but these, these punitive three strikes measures and so forth, um, you know, we've gone down this road before and, and they don't work. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not a popular thing and anyone... Whose, whose livelihood depends on popularity is not going to link themselves to the entertainment industry with this. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think your, your, your point about it is as people move to streaming is really important as well. Why would you stuff your hard drive with illicit MP3s that you don't know what they are or, or even right. get a chance to listen to them because you've got 20, 
two million songs available at the click of a button on Spotify or on exactly. audio or Move or whatever your service is. But I guess it, it's much more of an issue for the TV and the film industry as well because certainly uh, in the UK, pretty much anything on HBO is seen as the holy grail of TV in the UK and people will pay a lot of money for expensive box sets, but they'll also furiously torrent anything as soon as it airs in the US. So like Game of Thrones is probably the, the biggest example of a, a of a big budget uh, kind of series in the UK, and people are furiously trying to uh, torrent that. But, uh, but even things like The Wire, when it was on originally in the in the US and wasn't yeah. available in the UK, people would torrent that, or The Sopranos, or Boardwalk Empire, or anything like that. Yeah. So well, yeah, the HBO is really um, a, a very interesting case study right now because they are clinging to the old model furiously, you know, and, and they're not letting anyone have access to the content unless they have an old school pay by the month premium cable subscription. Yeah. Um, and good for them, you know, rightly so that that is their right as the people who own this premium content. And I you know, honestly, but, yeah. yeah, sorry, I was just gonna, you know, yeah, make sure. the obvious point that sort of that means that because of this, there, there's going to be more and more people who are trying to tour in it. So yeah. You know, I, I eventually there's going to be sort of a, a moment of truth for HBO and Showtime and the others, um, I think, on this. And they're going to have to make a decision. They can't just do those HBO Go um, password things anymore. I'm not sure if that is, is a really solid future model for them. Yeah, I, I think they also they also need to do international releases for these things because particularly with Facebook and Twitter and people talking about these shows, an international audience grows up really quickly, desperate to see these shows. There is no legal way for them to see these shows. So you can understand why people go on to some torrent site to to watch this because they would, in theory, they would pay to, to watch these shows. They just cannot legally get them. Right. Um, and the, the TV and the movie industry is very different from the music industry because for the most part, as soon as a, a record's released anywhere uh, in any country, it's available in pretty much every other country on the same day. So it's kind of day and date release, whereas uh, there's a lot more windowing in uh, the movie industry and uh, the TV industry. And I remember certainly, and this was uh, in the 1980s anyway, as soon as a, a film was released in the US, it would take 18 months, 24 months before it was released in the UK. There was a huge window, and obviously there was no way of, of pirating that content, but we would be reading about, I don't know, Back to the Future or Rocky Three or whatever, and we would you would hear about it opening in the US and blockbuster success, and we would have to wait until the next summer to watch it. So um, we thought that was ridiculous then, but uh, it's much more ridiculous now that people have the technology to access this content or watch it internationally. And people want to watch stuff on their iPad or their laptop, and the technology is there to let them do it. So I think the, the it's a it's a thing that the TV industry and the the movie industry are going to have to get their heads around and. The the music industry always always gets a kick in for being the the backward thinking industry. But if you compare it to the way uh, the TV and the movie industry works, it looks like the music industry is moving at lightning speed through digital, and everybody else looks really really slow. Really the slow, gaming yeah. industry seems to have got it with kind of Xbox Live and things like that. So doing international releases for big gaming titles, why can't TV and uh, movies do it the exact same way? And I think the more they hold back, uh, the more the the demand for illicit content will grow. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, and, uh, this, just, this sorry, the the what you just described, I, I didn't realize this situation in in Europe with the HBO shows. But what you just described is very sounded very familiar. It reminded me um, of of that time period. You guys, I'm sure remember from '99 to 2003, which was the point from when Napster really took off to the point when the Apple Store opened. Yeah, and those yeah. four years, I mean, not we, to defend we, we, copyright we infringement, but those four years were sort of when the record industry kind of lost its its whole market to, to piracy because they yeah, didn't yeah. make any – people wanted access to this stuff online and they weren't getting it and they didn't want to be pirates or thieves. Well, some did, but most didn't. Yeah. And um, and they did. There was no way they could get it. So yeah. if yeah. if there's a great episode of Game of Thrones on uh, somewhere in existence yeah. in the world and you love Game of Thrones and you can't get it, you're going to take extreme measures, perhaps, yeah. and, 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 and that's something that I it's illegal it's, and it's bad and it's wrong and there's no defending it, but it should be acknowledged from a from a business model perspective. Sure, yeah. and looking at the figures, there's a 
uh, Torrent Freak actually pointed out there were more than one million downloads of uh, the the first episode of of the third series uh, after the after the airing, including mm -hmm. a record breaking one hundred sixty three thousand simultaneous uh, downloads of the file, which had never happened before. Uh, wow. the, the latest record was one hundred forty three thousand set by Heroes in two thousand and eight, wow. and uh, and the funny thing just as a as a postscriptum was that uh, the uh, HBO programming president Michael Lombardo. Uh, said that uh, the demand is there and it certainly didn't negatively impact DVD sales, uh, talking about piracy. It's something that comes along with having a wildly successful show on a subscription network. So I guess for now they're still making so much money, sort of money hand over fist uh, through that model, that they're not really worrying about how much money they're losing by not, by not allowing people to watch it through different channels. Mm. The question is when they start doing the maths as to how much money they could make if they were allowing people to pay for the show when it comes out in the US, then maybe it would look a little bit differently to them, but I don't, I don't know. Yeah, HBO I don't think and movies are kind of in that same transitional phase that, that really drove the music industry, the record industry crazy during that time period I'm talking about, which is that there were still plenty of people supporting a healthy business under the old model. Yeah. Um, and, and, the tra and to make an immediate transition to the new model would take away your entire very profitable business. Um, so the question, you know, of course, that this is, it's, a, it's a strategic inflection point. It's always the question that comes up, sort of, you know, there's a fork in the road that leads you to a new business. Do you just jump into it? Do you do what Apple did and, you know, turn your back on, on the old model and start making iPods and iPhones? Or, or you know, do you, do you, um, do you, do you stick with the, with the old model? Um, and, and there's got to be sort of a, a midpoint. There's got to be a way of transitioning that. You know, if they, if they, and this is a crucial point for both industries, if they handle it incorrectly, um, certainly the record industry, the, the shrinkage it, it's, it's been through the last 10 years could be their fate as well. All right, well, let's end with uh, sort of a, on a lighter note, talking about April's Fools, of course. Uh, it's always a kind of a fun time of the year for uh, tech stories and music tech stories in particular. And there were a, a few a few really fun ones. Uh, I don't know, uh, uh, Eamon, did, did you see anything that was particularly funny or that he almost fell for? Uh, uh, I certainly I, did. I, I will hold my hands up and say I absolutely hate April Fools. I hate, I hate the culture <laughs> of nice. April Fools. No, I, I particularly, it just, seems, it just seems really tired that everybody has to do it and everybody, yeah. so you just go, you wake up in the morning and you go, right, okay, which one's the April Fool? I think the, the investment that, that some people do into them <laughs> is quite good, but I think yeah. they, they need to be short and punchy. A lot of the ones that I read were a bit too long and you go, right, okay, I've got the joke, and then the, it was just kind of laboured and laboured Labor. The one that I did like, which I just thought was quite funny, uh, was the uh, the Google Knows one. I, I quite liked the idea of that yeah. because I would I would quite like that to be real. It's very, <laughs> and it's of like, course, oh, those are always the best ones, aren't they? The ones that are actually you would like to see happen. Yeah, I think just the fact that they made those videos as well, and uh, it was like it, it's an old joke. Though, that, like loads of comedians have done things about things like smelly vision and stuff like that. It's, it's not a new idea, but I just thought the the execution of it was quite good because it's not outside the realms of possibility. Yeah, as well. But that that that, that, that was the one that I kind of liked the most, just simply because. Rather than me going, oh, I'm glad that's not real. I was going, I wish that was real. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I had, I had that kind of a. I'm glad, I'm glad that's not a real reaction to the Spotify story. Oh yeah, uh, yeah. Because uh, I think I sleepily read through like the first two paragraphs on the first, and I was just kind of about to post an angry reply on Twitter, going, "Why the, what the hell?" Especially on the heels of the of the rumors of the Facebook announcement of, of their own it, phone. I, I think, I think the timing was was pretty bad in the UK because April the first fell on a bank holiday so yeah. most news sources uh, news gathering emails wouldn't wouldn't be going out on a monday yeah. so it kind of you could have got away better with kind of weaving it into a broader kind of round up of the news and then kind of slipped in the april feel but if it was just the one story on that one it's day easier I think, to spot. yeah yeah, yeah it's, it was just it was just the the anomaly of going out on a public holiday and the youtube closure was also pretty good we're closing down YouTube. That's that's the last. <laughs> oh really? <laughs> yeah, it was really good. Yeah, yeah. It was kind of like to tomorrow night. We're we're closing the contest. YouTube was just a massive contest to, to find the best video online. And tomorrow right. night it's going to be over, and we're going to close down YouTube and <laughs> and just uh, find the winner of of the contest. That was that was quite a good one. Oh, Although, like you know, I, I should have seen that one then. Maybe yeah. my aversion to April Fools made me just switch off the internet for a day. Yeah. 
Exactly. But, you know, I, I, my, uh, my philosophy about April Fools is similar to yours. Uh, you know, I'm always looking out for the bucket of water and yeah. feeling annoyed that I have to do that. Um, but, uh, but generally, um, you know, I like. I thought that most of the ones you sent, Andrea, were funny. Um, the the one that's not on the list that that's that just caught my eye was, you know, that that noted humorist Justin Bieber, who uh, you know put a posted something on Twitter saying he was taking fans' calls at an eight hundred number, and the eight hundred number was actually the number for TMZ. So I thought that was <laughs> simple, <laughs> short, punchy. Well, you I, know. I, nice. with, with that Justin Bieber one, given the fact that he kind of had a bit of a meltdown the other week in the UK yeah. and had his monkey seized in quarantine in <laughs> was uh, that not an April in, Fool's in story? The German airport. I was going. Well, that, he, I thought that was an April Fool story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is the April Fool story? That's right. Yeah, his, his kind right. of April Fool's been started kind of mid February, I think. <laughs> and the, the only footnote I want to mention is that uh, you know you mentioned smelly vision. I just wanted to say I'm glad that hasn't been invented yet. Because you know, while Eamon, it looks like you have a nice pot of tea behind you. Yeah. Um, right there is uh, my bathroom. So, so uh, uh, I'm just happy that uh, <laughs> we're not in smelly vision right now. So. <laughs> nice. Well, that's great. And anything, uh, your end uh, before we wrap up uh, in terms of uh, articles you've written or anything that you want to plug, uh, Steve? Um, nothing I want to plug. I, I just want to mention I, my, my next project is I'm working on a biography of Michael Jackson. So, uh, wow, if anybody great. Has any tips, um, you know, it's a pretty complex, difficult subject and, um, I'm trying to interview as many people as I can, but, uh, well, off, uh, off, once, once, once we stop recording, I can give you a contact for somebody who will be really useful to speak great. to. Great. I would love that. Yeah. If, if anybody I, has, I, any I, tips. I, can, I can do an, I can do an introduction t- as well. Maybe, we'd love maybe. that. Maybe he's on the list, but anyway, when we, we stop recording, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll give Thank you Thank you details. so much. That would be great. And uh, if any of, of, of the viewers of this program have any tips, my email address is stevenopper at yahoo.com. Great. Awesome. Uh, Eamon, anything, any project uh, or recent feature that you're writing? What am I doing? Well, I just did a thing for Music Ally on uh, budget uh, subscription services and if they can kind of bridge that gap between paying zero or paying £10 or $10 a month. So it was things like The Click, Bloom FM, which is a mobile service in the yeah. UK, uh, O2 Tracks, uh, Nokia Music Class. Did you talk about these services that are, are trying to kind of mop up a, a kind of more mainstream audience because... Spotify, while it's really big, is still tiny in terms of overall penetration. Six million subscribers in a, I think the the market, the collective population of the markets is in something like eight hundred million. So it's got like point yeah. seven percent penetration in terms of subscribers. So there's a long way to go with subscription services, and I think there's a real need for mainstream ones. So I look, there, there just seemed to be a real wave in the last couple of weeks of these kind of mid price services yeah. coming into the market so I just did a piece on that that's great and that's on musicali.com and you can also find uh, Eamon has got uh, I think a, a bi-weekly or monthly I'm not sure podcast uh, on musicali as well every week you can ch- every, every week Tuesday. okay great awesome yes. that you can check out so uh, go and check out that one as well and uh, that's it uh, thanks so much for uh, joining me on the show guys and thanks so much for listening uh, Digital Music Trends uh, is available on uh, a number of channels you can check out the site on digitalmusictrends.com uh, follow the show on Twitter the handle is DG Music Trends, and subscribe to the newsletter have a great week and till next time and you can also follow the latest on DMT by liking the page on facebook.com slash digitalmusictrends 